Hello. Thanks, Dwayne. Uh, yeah, my name is Will Collins. Um, I'm an analytics development leader at National Grid in the UK. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about a, a risk-based uh, approach uh, that we've developed to uh, asset management. Uh, we're based, well, I'm based in Warwick in the UK, which is a town right in the middle of, of, the, of England. Um, and before you ask, yes, there is a castle there. Um, we don't live in it, though, but there is a castle. So it's going to be a whistle-stop stop tour of what electricity transmission is. Um, I'm going to talk about National Grid, who we are, um, a little bit more about our regulatory framework, which affects a couple of parts of our business. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the monetized risk framework that we've developed, um, the methodology that we've implemented. Um, we've developed a web app using uh, Anaconda and deployed that to, some, to a server internally. Um, next bit is about uh, the maintenance planning, so maintenance of these assets. How, how can we automate, how can we assist the planning of this, uh, this process? I'll then talk a little bit more about uh, the condition monitoring activities that we, we do um, to, to, to maintain our assets, to, to monitor um, where they are along their life cycle, um, including things such as DGA, which is dissolved gas analysis, um, a little bit of work that we did with uh, natural language processing in, uh, to determine the survival analysis of some assets, and uh, probably the most interesting one is actually the, the one right at the end, which is the uh, overhead line condition uh, monitoring, which uh, uses uh, videos and helicopters. That's why it's interesting. So National Grid UK, who are we and what are we responsible for? So we were founded in 1990 following the privatization of uh, the generation transmission activities in England and Wales. We uh, own and operate uh, the high voltage electricity transmission network in England and Wales, and the gas transmission network in Great Britain. So that includes Scotland as well. We're responsible for the day-to-day uh, the -day balancing activity uh, uh, and s of supply and demand across the country. So prior to that, everything was uh, government owned um, under what was called the CGB, the Central Electricity Generation Board. So a little bit about our corporate structure. Um, National Grid PLC sit right at the top. Um, we've got um, a US business, quite a large US business um, based up in the, in the north northeast. Uh, so Massachusetts, uh, Rhode Island, and, and New York. I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to focus on the UK side. Um, and on the UK side, we've got these three uh, businesses, electricity transmission, uh, gas, uh, and uh, the ventures part, which is uh, an, an unregulated part of the business. So the ventures um, business is responsible for the metering, LNG, liquid liquefied natural gas, and the interconnectors um, elements of, of the company. But I'm going to talk about the, uh, the regulated businesses, the electricity transmission and the, the gas transmission. So we're a monopoly business. Um, we are the only uh, electricity transmission business in the country. Um, we're funded by uh, the bill payer. Um, so anyone who uh, has an electricity supply or a gas supply ultimately pays for our services um, themselves. Network companies are traditionally a, a, a monopoly business. Um, you don't get to choose uh, which one you use. And transmission networks are considered a, uh, a critical na national infrastructure. So our regulator's called Ofgem. Uh, they're the office uh, of the gas and electricity market. Uh, they set a ceiling on the amount that companies can earn from the, uh, the charges um, to use the network. This is done to, to protect uh, the consumers and ensure that they get, get value and make sure that we can operate the uh, networks efficiently and sustainably while, while making a good return as well. Our regulatory framework, our price control that currently exists is called RIO, which stands for revenue. So our company's revenue is dependent upon incentives, innovation, and outputs. Incentives and innovation are kind of the same thing. Um, it's about uh, financial incentives to perhaps um, do something slightly different, um, do something safer, a bit more reliability, reliable. Um, we've got a test bed facility, which, is, which was approved last year. So we've been given a grant from, uh, from Ofgem um, to use what's, what's a decommissioned substation, um, where we will be able to test assets to, I guess, destruction, 
um, to see how far we can push them. But it's done in a safe way. It's in a, it's a decommissioned, it's a disconnected substation that is uh, not used anymore. Um, so a little bit more about the price control. The outputs part, there are five categories on the output. Um, we've got safety, reliability, environmental impact, customer satisfaction, and customer connections. So we consider a, uh, we have a world-class safety record. We are world leaders in that, and the reliability is world-class as well. So it's in our, in it's in our uh, um, best interest to maintain that record. So the part that I work in is called the uh, transmission owner. Um, these two parts at the bottom, you've got the system operator and the transmission owner. The system operator are the guys who sit in the control room. Uh, they've got a wall of screens, and they're looking at the, they can see the, the generation that's happening around the country. Uh, they can see where the demand is going. They can see the, uh, the position of, they can see the electrical flows across it. And it's their responsibility to ensure that um, demand matches supply. Um, so, in the UK, or in England anyway, we have this uh, concept, of we have this phenomenon called TV pickup, um, which is when, a, when a, a, a TV show finishes, everyone goes to make a cup of tea, or open the fridge, flush the toilet, whatever you want, and there's a surge of electricity. So, the system operator, they, uh, they have a, a, a team who are responsible for monitoring um, the, the TV schedules and following uh, plot lines on uh, soap operas as well. <laughs> Large sporting events as well. So half time in a football game um, is very important. You've th they'll bring on what's called pump storage, dem uh, pump storage stations, which are, there's a couple in the UK. There's, uh, there's one which is, they've, they've, they're two lakes essentially. Um, there's one in, large one in Wales, a lake which is filled with water at the top and, no, and an empty reservoir at the bottom. Open the gates, the water comes through, electricity is generated within seconds which is important for uh, making a cup of tea. So electricity transmission, uh, tr tr typical tr transmission assets include uh, overhead lines, uh, underground cables, and substations. Um, our high voltage networks run at, at 400,000 volts and 275,000 volts. Um, Great Britain's linked to France and Ireland uh, France, Ireland, and the Netherlands through interconnectors. There are two more interconnectors planned um, to connect through to Belgium and Norway, um, each about a gigawatt each, uh, I think. Um, we don't operate uh, low voltage distribution networks, and we don't have any generation, uh, nor do we supply to customers. But I think in the US business, they supply to the customers. Um, so that's our part in the, in the, in the right. So generation happens with privatized um, that's, that's owned by other companies, private companies. Transmission comes to us at 400,000 volts and then down to the distribution network for onward to uh, the rest of the, uh, the, cu the country and the customers. So obviously electricity is carried uh, across the country by conductors. Transmission, transmission network transports electricity over, over long distances um, via conducting wires. A substation is a, a, a common connecting point um, for overhead lines and cables, um, like a, a node, if you like, in a, in a network. Uh, generators um, and, and interconnectors from other countries connect and supply energy to the transmission network at these substations. You've also got some large demand customers uh, at the and distribution networks, which take energy out of the system at that point. So some stats there. It's a small country, really. Um, we've got... Uh, four and a half thousand miles of overhead line. We've got a thousand miles of underground cable and 342 substations, which is a bit less than the 46,000 miles of overhead line managed by ERCOT, which is the Texan power grid. Uh, I was looking more about this. The ERCOT said um, they said on their website that uh, their their peak demand um, last year was 72 gigawatts in the summer. I accept that it's hot here. Um, air conditioning would be the, the primary thing. But our, our UK peak demand is 55 gigawatts. So, and uh, there's only there's 60 million of us. I think there's only 24 million of you. So, <laughs> there we go. I, I know you, en you Americans like your energy. Let's, let's not get started on the size of your cars. <laughs> so, a little bit more about some asset types. We've got uh, transformers. 
Uh, they enable the efficient transmission of, of electricity by increasing voltage, uh, reducing the current in the circuits, and reducing electrical losses um, through, the, through transmission. We've got supergrid transformers used at the generator uh, connection to increase voltage at the substation, reduce it again for onward distribution to, to customers. Uh, transformers are also very important because they limit uh, the amount of current that flows um, if there's a fault uh, to a level that will not cause damage and can be turned off by a circuit breaker. Overhead lines are pretty self-explanatory. They are uh, conductors made of uh, layered wires uh, of aluminium or with a steel core uh, for strength. Um, circuit breakers are probably a little bit more interesting. Uh, they're, high, they're high voltage switching devices. They can be used to uh, switch circuits on and off under normal and fault conditions. Um, switching under normal conditions controls the flow around the network, um, but if a fault occurs, a, a, a circuit breaker must operate extremely quickly, and they can disconnect up to 63,000 amps um, in, a, in a tenth of a second. So a circuit breaker, um, I'm told, when the company was, uh, in it, well, I'm not saying it's infancy, but a while ago, um, new people, new starters who were engineers at the company um, were given ear defenders and told to stand a safe distance away from a circuit breaker. The circuit breakers um, operate by popping open and there's typically a, a gas, either s SF6, which is a pretty nasty greenhouse glass gas, sulfur hexafluoride, um, which is which is then blasted out um, of the circuit breaker to extinguish the arc that's created when the, 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 the ends of the conductor pop apart. Um, apparently, they're unbelievably loud, and uh, the young people were, one chap told me that it was, uh, it was the noise just went straight through you, and it was um, a pretty nasty experience. I'm told they don't do that anymore, though, for good reasons, I think. So who are the analytics team? I work in the analytics team. We were formed in 2012 to assist with uh, implementation of a system um, designed to provide the single source of, of truth for the asset information. So we're quite new. Um, we weren't using Python or R or Anaconda at that point. Um, so, but what we were trying to do is consolidate all this information that we had, um, which was sitting on spreadsheets around the, com the, the, the company. So it, it made perfect sense to start uh, bringing all that together. So we work very closely with the engineers. We, tr we try to understand their, their problems and needs, and we try and provide them solutions. There's a team of about 10 of us. We've got a, uh, a couple of contractors that work, at work with us. Um, and we've got a variety of backgrounds, finance, automotive, so Rolls-Royce, Jaguar, and Land Rover. Um, I've worked at an energy supplier, Centrica, beforehand. And we procured Anaconda um, about a year ago uh, in March. So for us, all this data science stuff that's been going on is, is quite new. Um, but I, I'm going to show you a few things that we've done, and I hopefully you'll agree that we've, we've come quite away within the, within the last year. So this all forms, Anaconda forms a component of uh, what we've termed the Insights platform. So on the left-hand side, we've got our uh, systems of record, uh, the flat files, which all go into this data lake. The data lake initially didn't have much lake, uh, um, data in it, so it was more of a data pond, if you like. But it's slowly filling up. We're getting a bit more data in there. Um, we've got some uh, governance and control uh, systems on top of that as well um, to assist with some data quality rules. Um, we've also got a very strict IT governance policy. So uh, on as, as Dwayne mentioned, we procured Anaconda Workgroup, which allows us to have the on-prem repo, and we can um, set our rules, blacklisting certain packages if we don't like the look of them. A um, bit of visualization technology we use. We've got uh, business objects and Tableau as well. So this, is, this has been pretty great for us because um, we uh, made some new hires um, last year with people with experience of, of Python and R. Um, and Anaconda has been pretty great at, at leveraging their capabilities. So what do we do? Well, we try to form uh, the, the conduit, if you like, the link between the engineering experience that the company has, um, the guys who have been working there for 20, 30 years, who actually worked out on site, they know what they're doing. Um, and we're back in the office playing with computers. So we've got, uh, their we try and get their, their vast knowledge. Um, and they tend to look at specific problems. But I guess my, my view is that 
we have that level of ab abstraction um, from that, which can in some ways help because you can see as, an, uh, as, a, as a population of assets and you can start spotting trends rather than looking down into the minutiae of why a specific asset might have failed. So I'll move on to what I'm calling the cycle of asset management, the circle of life, if you like, Q, the Elton John. So starting with the modeling part, number one, we've got, um, we, we, are, we are modeling the degradation of the assets which give us the monetized framework, monetized risk framework I'll talk about in a minute. From that point, we maintain the assets, and this is when we can help to optimize that maintenance. Thirdly, we'll move on to how those assets are then monitored and operated, if you like, um, going forward. So uh, briefly, I'll talk about our risk framework. Um, this is a, a framework that was submitted and approved to our regulator um, last year, so we're in the process of, of implementing it. Um, we're using Python, we're using NumPy, Pandas, uh, all the usual suspects to do this. So uh, base, uh, uh, to, to briefly go through this, um, the assets are all, assets failures are, are, are independent of each other. The failure mode, i.e. a thing that can go wrong with an asset um, for a particular, er, er, treated as independent. An event which is a consequence, if you like, of a failure mode. Um, again, I was treat, uh, 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 not independent. Same event can uh, can arise through different failure modes. Um, and the model, we we're the, uh, just to, as a simplification, we're not including any uh, circuit or network network information uh, uh, in this model. So you've got assets down at the bottom. You can bring that up to regions, and then you can sum to get the the network. So. I like this slide because it's got a smiley face on it. So, the functional state. So, an asset can move from a functional state through to a failed state um, by calculating the probabilities all the way through. So, you can calculate uh, the probability of a failure mode occurring, i.e., a thing going wrong. What's the probability of the event occurring, given the failure mode has occurred, and get and from that you can get the probability of the event occurring. So, uh, when this got submitted for uh, approval we got told to remove the smiley face and there's a, there's a tick on the official document instead, so spoil sports, so eh? but it is what it is. So what you can do is you can take a uh, failure mode, which is, a, like I said, something going wrong with an asset, um, and you can look at how uh, those specific failure modes can be addressed. How, how can you fix a, um, how can you fix or reduce the probability of something going wrong? And we have, uh, packets of maintenance, if you like, interventions. We've got basic, ma basic, intermediate, major maintenance. Um, and obviously re replacement, refurbishment being the most extreme versions of that. So certain things can only be replaced by certain, uh, can only be addressed by certain types of intervention. In this example, um, you can see we've got Weibull survival curves, um, but actually we because with the framework that we've developed and the code that we've done, we've, we've created, um, that could be replaced with anything. So if, if, you, if, we, if, we, if we had, um, which we do have at some point, um, we can use some Kaplan-Meier analysis to, to calculate some, to fit some failure curves. Another, one, another thing I just want to quickly talk about is the end-of-life modifier element of this, which is um, using condition information to, to either age, to, to effectively age an asset. Um, so, for example, in the, a circuit breaker that may be used far too much for whatever reason, it, it might only be five years old, but it's got an operational count of something that should be about 30 years old. So, by using that information, you can map it through and place it along that failure curve and say that actually it should be behaving a little bit like a, an older asset. In the case of transformers, we can use the, the DGA, the di uh, dissolved gas analysis uh, results, and some frequency response analysis, and obviously oil leaks. Oil leaks are bad things. So the whole framework only works if you've got good um, failure curves. Um, and in order to get those failure curves, what we've done is we've, we've developed this web app um, using uh, Flask, um, which is sitting on top of our Python framework, uh, deployed it onto our server using Nginx. 
Um, what this does is it allows the en engineers to rapidly iterate the generation of those failure curves, um, and it provides a translation um, to to monetized risk and real events. So, if for whatever reason you've your parameters say that you're getting 60 transformer fires in a year, actually that's not correct. So you c it allows them to re-upload their data uh, and tweak all their parameters. A little bit more about what it looks like. Um, we can also, we can we've got some costs in here as well, so we can derive optimal maintenance frequency at an asset level. Um, and these are quite nice charts, I think. This is my opinion anyway. I, we are quite new to this, so um, this did. Uh, there's a there's a few CSS errors. If you if you can spot one, uh, you get some you get some points for that. Uh, these are D3 charts. We use Bootstrap and jQuery, um, and it's mapped through to the. Uh, you can see the number of events that we've got there. And we've got a little little map at the bottom showing the location of all the substations in the UK. So. We've got the the risk framework ready to go. Um, now the, the the next question is, um, having calculated a network risk as as a sum of all the individual assets, you can define your policy. How do you want to maintain those assets? To what level of risk are you accepting? Um, are you would you deem as acceptable along the on the network? Therefore, you can start looking at how would you implement that policy? What sort of maintenance do you need to do? The other thing you could potentially start looking at, we haven't moved on to just yet, but um, is looking at failure modes which are um, contributing towards the total risk on an asset. And you can do more targeted intervention. So instead of having these basic intermediate, this concept of basic intermediate major, you can actually look at intervening and addressing certain specific failure modes. Just like in your car, you, have a, you might have a major and a minor service. Um, but in reality, the thing that probably makes most of the difference is the oil change. So why not just do the oil change? You know, as long as it, it will probably elongate the, the life of the car the most, and it's probably the cheapest thing as well to do. So we have a planning team that, that take all the information that we've, we're providing to them, um, the policy uh, that, that's going to be derived from the new risk framework, and it's their job to schedule the maintenance. So they're looking at a multitude of factors across uh, across the piece, i.e. the maintenance that's due, due to the policy, any existing outages that might be taking place. For example, if a generator is connecting to the network, um, circuit has to come out of service while they get connected. Why not use that as an opportunity to maintain the assets that are offline at that point? System access constraints, similarly, we've got there may be only certain six, six weeks, for example, in, a, in an outage season uh, when uh, you, can, you could disconnect a, 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 a circuit and therefore um, maintain the assets. Resource constraints, obviously it takes time to train people up. Um, certain skill sets are required to, to complete different parts of, work, parts of the work. Um, people leave the company, there's uh, attrition rates as well. We can look at all of these types of things. So what we did is we've done a little proof of concept, uh, again, using our R and Python. Specifically, uh, we our Python version was using pandas, but it was quite slow, so we switched it to using NumPy. Um, we're looking to uh, minimize the total outage duration. So we look across a plan period, if you like, so 10 years or 20 years. What is the maintenance plan for any given circuit? So we need to source all the data. This is when our data lake comes in handy. We've got the asset register, some outage management uh, system, some network topology as well, uh, i.e. you've got along uh, the south coast of England, you can't take certain amounts of, of certain circuits out without disconnecting parts of the, of the of, uh, dis disconnecting customers ultimately. Other constraints, um, resource I've mentioned, uh, there's possible infeasible combinations of outage risk as well. And we formulated this as a, Nonlinear optimization problem. As with all optimization problems, we've limited the search base. So we try and take out these combinations from using the knowledge that the planners have got. Um, we take out uh, combinations of assets that cannot be taken uh, on any given outage. This is a traditional optimization model. Uh, try a plan. What's the cost? Try it again. Keep finding one that's. Uh, that's that's the cheapest, and then keep going until you've got a brute force, and then you can 
you can finish it off with a brute force and then you've got a final optimized plan. So as an example, um, a, an original plan would look like this. You've got higgledy-piggledy maintenance all over the place. You've got assets that are ta uh, ta outages that are taken almost every single year, a uh, combination of basic and major maintenance. It's not rocket science to see that this is a better way of managing it. Um, the point of this is that it uh, reduces the total number of outages that you end up taking. Um, and it's got a lower duration of total outage time. You don't really want the outages to overrun and incur large penalty costs. Um, and the all, the all the assets are maintained uh, to, to, to the compliance of the policy. So this is a piece of work that we're now rolling out across, across the network. We're taking the information. We're not saying to the planners, look, this is the final plan. This is what you've got to do. Um, go ahead and put this into practice. We're saying that this is a better version of what you had before. Um, but now you've got to use your in your knowledge and experience to uh, tweak it, I guess make it a little bit more deliverable, if that's a, a way of looking at it. Ideally, tell us what you've done so that we can then feed it back in. Um, and ultimately, um, deliver some cost savings. Um, the final part I'm going to talk about is uh, how we monitor our assets. Um, why do we monitor the assets? Uh, it's quite obvious. We it reduces outage costs and we spot faults. Um, and what we can do is we've got our risk framework, we've got our plan, we now, we now got to take care of those assets, we've got to operate them. Um, and we can compare the asset health um, to the predicted degradation as given by those, those failure curves that have been calibrated by the engineers. See where they are, are they where they should be? And obviously it all drip, uh, boils down to employing, uh, improving uh, safety, employing public safety. So this is an example of when things go wrong this is a transformer file that happened in 2013. The good thing to say from this, obviously you can't really hide this from the public, but you can see that the uh, the oil is actually well contained at the bottom. There's a uh, there's a concrete there's a concrete bunge at the bottom which is uh, containing all the oil. So it's obviously in our interest to maintain uh, transformers to an analyze the oil that's inside them because there is no other way of of really telling the condition of a transformer without sampling the oil. So the, sa the oils get oil samples get sent off to a lab, they send back the results, and we can start trending that. So the typical data exploration thing that we do with, with R and Python is correlation matrix that we've got here. Uh, yeah, you can just about see that. So people find parts of packets of data across, uh, across the company. They'll, they'll send it to us and we'll have a look at it, see if there's anything meaningful there. Um, what's great in this example, we've, we've, uh, we use the R Studio, R Notebook, um, but we can send it back to the, the engineers. We can create an HTML file and send it back to them so that they can have a look at it. So we also work with uh, universities. There's the University of Warwick, which is very close to us, um, and they've helped us um, in, a, in a number of ways. Uh, this first one is Again, like I said, the dissolved gas analysis, they look for about eight or nine uh, gases that are dissolved with within the oil in a transformer. And the levels of those gases suggest uh, perhaps the condition of the, of the transformer. Um, so we can do a bit of trending. We can map out their thought process. This was a great project, the asset defects. Um, this one covered uh, this was using uh, two data sets. We had a piece of, uh, we had one data set which was, um, which gave details of when asset, when some supergrid transformers were replaced, um, but it didn't say why. And then there's another data set that's got uh, what we're calling the defects data set, which is uh, made up of everyone's worst nightmare, free text. So you wouldn't believe how many different ways there are to spell transformer. So, <laughs> with a bit of NLP, we try we managed to categorize it, um, categorize those defects, and those defects were then mapped to the replacement of the asset. So, we can then, like I mentioned earlier, we we can fit some survival curves using Kaplan Meyer um, to ultimately uh, determine whether or not uh, when a, when a supergrid transformer will fail. 
So the last thing I'm going to talk to you about is probably the most interesting, actually. We've got two helicopters. Um, and they survey overhead lines. Uh, and they identify potential faults with towers, fittings, or conductors. Uh, another story I just want to quickly tell you is on my first job, um, I worked for a, an energy supplier in the UK, and we, we were selling electricity to uh, business customers. And the way that that worked is they would submit uh, uh, a request. They would give us a list of all their sites, and they would, they would, we, would, we would bid um, to uh, get them the t their cheapest deal. So the system that we had, um, every, meter in the every electricity meter in the UK has a unique number. It's called an MPAN, meter point access number, um, which was the primary key of the database in this system. We did not have access to the back end of this system. We only could use the front end. Um, so you can imagine a chain of shops. Um, chain of shops um, would have a set of, of, of meters. They might have 30 sites across the, comp uh, the country. But what we did is what we had uh, occasionally, or a couple of times a year, would be um, a group of brokers um, who would get together um, a list of customers, a group of customers potentially, and they'd send that they want, let's say, 10,000 sites all, ma all, ma all uh, priced together because that's the way the, the discounting comes through. The problem was we probably already had about 6,000 of those meters in the system under different customer names. So it was someone's job, not mine, there was, it was someone's job to go through the front end searching for 6,000 meters click through several screens, delete it, and then resave it, and then exit, repeat it. So we hired a temp to do that. So I, w I, was I can't believe he managed to do it. But at the, end of at the end of the week when he did it, he said to me, Will, this is the worst job I've ever had. <laughs> so the next time it came around, I I, I, you know, it was quite a, an obvious process what, he, what, what, we kn what needed to be done. So I used a bit of free software called Win Macro, which was mirrored the uh, the mouse movements and the clicks and the button presses and everything, and it did the whole thing. We just let it run overnight, and it and it did it. Some people say that's lazy. I call that smart working. Then. And in the same vein, this uh, this this problem um, manifests itself. So, like I said, we've got two helicopters surveying the overhead lines, uh, and. We've probably got about six hours. They're doing it six hours a day. So they're collecting all this, all this footage. It's then someone's job to review it. So I'll show you what they have to look at. It'll start with one of these. So the videos always start like this. And you can see, I'll stop it there. So that is uh, the plate that's on the side, the name plate that's on the side of the, the tower, the pylon, if you like. 4YZ7X as well is a unique identifier for it. So what we've done is we, we, s we walked past, actually, it was one of the, the guys in the team who walked past the people who are reviewing this footage. There are two guys who review this footage. And said, oh, that's, that looks quite interesting. What are you doing there? And they're watching this footage back, and they're actually looking for um, this information. They want to know what tower they're looking at. Then the helicopter guys will vi video on uh, elements of the tower, and the guys back in the office will note down the condition of the towers. So why can't we use computers to do this? Smart working again. Bit of OCR on that. So. That's something we've we've start we've put together. Um, there's there's many elements. So I'll talk about the next element. This is the so first bit is to get the OCR on that, so you can use the enhanced computer enhance algorithm or something magical like that. Um, twist it around and you can do some OCR and you get the 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 text of that. That's the first bit. Next bit is a bit more interesting. You can see the zoom on this, these cameras is, is fantastic. So what they're looking for, you can see there's this, these overhead lines. They're looking for these. These are called spacers. And these keep the conductors apart from each other. See, this one's in a, a cross formation. 
And you think, oh, they're not that big. They're about this big. So they're monitoring the condition. They're trying to find out the condition of any of these. Because if they break, bad things happen. I don't know why they've zoomed in on this guy now. <laughs> so it keeps going like this. And they move along. They start at the tower, they move along, and they end at the, end at the, t end at the other tower. And that's all they do. They've got, they've got these hours of footage. And they're only interested in these, really. But you see there's all this wasted time in between. There's a lot of cars there. Let's see if there are any other interesting bits. There we go. Ah, oh, England. There we go. Spacer, found one. What's that one look like? Yeah, it looks okay, yeah. So what we've done is we've trained up some hard cascades using OpenCV to do this. So it'll pick out. Um, so what we did is we've, we've got about 3,500 uh, positive samples and 17,000 negative samples. And we, you see this is a green box now. The other one was a red box because it's a slightly different type of spacer. So what we've done is we've we wrote a Python application to accelerate the generation and annotation of these samples. So we we took it in turns to read these, to watch these videos, and pick out the let's look at the identified one again, and pick out the uh, the components, pick out the the reference data samples. What we've then done is we've we've created a a, a front end which allows the user to essentially view a highlights reel of, uh, of this type of thing. So they can skip through the video only seeing the spaces that they're interested in. So it's none of this, this dead time in the middle is, is, is chopped out basically. So we've got what would have been, a th let's say a 30 minute video is now condensed into five minutes. So we've saved them 25 minutes on a typical video. You know, um, it's been a really good, uh, they've been really receptive to this obviously. Because I don't think I'd want to watch all of this. Makes me feel motion sick just looking at it, actually. But again, like I said, the, the, the work that we try to do is, is not replace them. We're not trying to replace the, we're not trying to take their jobs away from them. We're trying to help them, make them focus on the things that matter, i.e., the condition of these spaces. So present them back, this highlights real, pictures, reference pictures of what the, what the best spaces are start, starting to look like. The next step, which we haven't moved on to yet, is next identifying what, uh, what does a broken one look like? Because we haven't found many, to be honest. Um, so once we get some reference, ver reference data uh, of what a broken spacer looks like, that's when we can start training it up. So that's pretty much everything I want to talk to you about. We've got. Um, I think we're on the right path. You know, we're in, like I said, we're a newish data science team. We've only been around. Um, uh, we've been around since 2012, but we've only been using these types of tools for the last uh, year, year and a half, that type of thing. And it's highlighted the importance of, of good data collection. No more free text. No more free text. And, and we try. It allows us to try uh, new methods of, of modeling, and we can we can fail fast, and we can try something. If it's nothing, we can move on. We've deployed our web app as well, um, using that insights platform that I mentioned. Um, and we're improving process and sharing this data with the engineers so that they can really focus their, their knowledge um, on solving the problems. And we're finding that more and more data is regularly discovered throughout the company. Uh, it's a big company. People have got stuff on their computers. They're not telling us about it. We don't know about it. So this type of thing, just by walking past their desk, uh, we got access to hours and hours of, of video footage, and we've able to we've been able to help them. So that's it. Are there any questions?